Okay, good morning. This is Richard Shu, host of Shu Untied. Uh, this morning, I'm really thrilled and honored to have with me as my guest, Michelle Lee, who's the general counsel at Pinterest. Michelle, welcome to the program. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So, Michelle, let me start by asking you uh, why you went to law school in the first place. Oh, well, we're going way back here. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I always wanted to be a lawyer. So, oh, interesting. Uh, you know, when I was in college, uh, the choice seemed easy. I, from a very young age, I thought, what a neat profession to be involved in. Mm -hmm. I went and visited one law school class while I was in college, uh, and that was taught by Professor Jamie Raskin on constitutional law, who's now in Congress. Um, and it was just a remarkable class. And I thought there mm -hmm. nothing else I'd rather do than go to law school and learn about the law. Um, in my, in my future so yeah and did you know what kind of lawyer you were going to be when you started law school when did you figure that out uh well at a young age i watched far too much matlock so i thought i was going to be a really good criminal defense lawyer mm -hmm. um and uh and solve every sort of you know problem within 60 minutes uh but uh later on i think you know i very much was interested in constitutional issues i never thought i'd actually get to practice that Mm -hmm. uh, but fortunately, later on in my career, when I was at Twitter, I got to do quite a bit of First Amendment, First Amendment law. Interesting. Well, yeah. tell me a little bit about your, the progression of your career. I've been graduating law school. It sounds like you went into private practice for a little while. I did. I did. Uh, first stop out of law school uh, was I, I went into a firm, which sounds like at this point, you know, for some a conventional step for me, I think I was pretty darn lucky and fortunate. Um, I was not, you know, I remember my second year of law school, someone said, if you get a, if you get a C in law school, you're toast, your future mm -hmm. is done. Mm -hmm. Um, and I fell into that category and I remember thinking, oh gosh, my future is done. I better get a part-time job. <laughs> and so when I was in law school, I, I took a part-time job at a law firm working as a law clerk part-time. Um, and that led to another part-time job at White and Case. And so they hired me as an antitrust law clerk. Mm. Um, and from there, they hired me on as an associate. Uh, and that that was how I started my career um, and how I paid down my law school loan. So, <laughs> of course. Well, is that is that is that what you wanted to do antitrust work or that just was the that was just the opportunity that presented itself? That was the opportunity that presented itself. The first law clerk job I had was one where we were at a plaintiff's firm. So it was literally read the newspapers and find us cases, which was mm -hmm. something that they actually talked about doing, you know, scour the newspapers, find us the next big antitrust case. Uh, when I was at White and Case, I learned a little bit about more about what antitrust is. And that was that was the opportunity. And it was a, a case about shipping containers and they were not much for um, electronic documentation. So we just had um, massive, massive printouts of, um, you know, prices at, printed out where we had to review. And, mm. and so that was my, my first antitrust associate job. Mm. So uh, you, were, you were a litigator, I'm assuming. Yes, yes. Uh, it, at, at the point, it was a big criminal antitrust case, and that was sort of my first mm. uh, exposure into the antitrust world. Mm. And uh, since I loved it, though, loved antitrust, both on the criminal and later, more so even on the civil side. Um, really interesting to think about market dynamics, um, how markets function, state of competition, and, and the skills I learned back then are, are useful even today. Did that tie in anything you'd studied in college? Like, did you do economics or anything like that? Was no, there, I, I took no? macro and I was terrible, absolutely <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I should, at this point, I think to myself every so often, I should go back and retake that class <laughs> just so now maybe I can have a little bit of a better understanding about what's happening. <laughs> now, um, you'd ace, now you'd ace that class. Maybe. Uh. <laughs> well, now at some point you, may, you ventured into the government. Tell me a little bit how that happened. Yeah. Uh, so when I was at a firm, I was first at White and Case, and then I was at Wilson Sonsini. And back then, uh, antitrust trials were not that common, mm -hmm. but I really wanted to get in a courtroom. I just thought mm -hmm. the neatest thing would be to stand up in court and actually get the experience of arguing cases. And I remember mm -hmm. being in a firm, someone had said, you know, you're going to wait until you're in your maybe sixth year by the time you get to take a deposition. Right. And that just seemed like a really long time to sort of be stuck in the doc review pen or drafting, you know, sort of non-dispositive motion. So I, I thought I really wanted the opportunity to get to government. And so uh, at the time, civil fraud was hiring uh, oh. the Department of Justice. 
and they were hiring because it was a part of the government that was bringing in money. So on the civil side, we'd you know, investigate cases, we'd partner with agents to investigate cases of fraud committed against the government, um, healthcare space, defense contractor space, uh, lots, of, lots of places, wherever the government gives money, there is fraud. Um, and so <laughs> it, was, it was a really incredible experience working cool. for the Department of Justice. Cool. Uh, I got the wish of taking endless numbers of depositions, um, got to stand up in court and say, I represent the United States of America, which was wild. I remember thinking I said that in court and thought, Am I, who let me say this? I mean, this seems <laughs> impossible that someone would let me stand here to represent the government. Um, but it, it was it was such a rewarding experience. Huh. Huh. How many trials did you get to do there in the government? Uh, uh, it was uh, mainly investigations. I think I was there long enough for one to get out to some, I, no, I never sat through a full trial, sadly. I had summary okay. judgment, I had case investigations, but I never got to a, a full trial when I was oh, at government. Oh, oh. But you really enjoyed the government experience? It was, it, 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 it scratched the itch you were looking for? It was fun. I, you know, being on that side is so much harder than being on the defense side. Building a case and anticipating oh. all of the potential holes in a theory is just incredibly challenging um, and requires a level of rigor and detail, being detail oriented that that just was such a good, good life lesson to be. Yeah. To be and I'm assuming you work with some incredible lawyers there. I mean, people who, who I mean, must have been some incredible lawyers. Incredibly brilliant. People. Yeah, yeah. Like the yeah. type of people who can cite case law by the page and the number or the treatise. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was just remarkable. Yeah, I can imagine. Such talented attorneys all around me. Well, at some point, you obviously left the government. Tell me a little bit about why, why, what happened? Did you kind of feel like you burned out or what was the reason? Less burnout and more. I'd been living in D.C. for about 10 plus years. Uh -huh. And I, uh, I remember visiting a friend for a wedding. Uh, he got married out in San Francisco. And my husband and I went and thought, my goodness, what an incredible place to be. Oh. Everyone should get to live like this. <laughs> and it was in San Francisco. And so uh, I started dropping some resumes and uh, the department. Uh, and so uh, at that point, unexpectedly, um, Visa reached out. I, I didn't know oh. anyone there. I just dropped a resume cold um, and Visa reached out to for me to do an interview and I made it through the process and then they hired me on to do both litigation and antitrust, which was great. I, I thought civil fraud cases were very, very fun, but I really missed thinking about antitrust issues, thinking about markets and and the, the role that Visa had was both litigation and antitrust and I loved it. So how did you compare? Because you'd obviously been in private practice, you'd been in government, you'd never been in house. How did you compare that experience and what did you think? It was, you know, it, the, the skills of being proactive and really leaning forward to develop your own cases in the government proved very useful for being in-house because there's no manual for, you know, how to succeed in an in-house environment. It's very much um, driving projects forward on your own and really taking initiative. Uh, I, I did quickly learn, though, that being in-house has sort of a, um, a it, it's much more political. It's much mm -hmm. more. Um, and I discovered this because I was in a meeting where we were meeting with the president of the company. And I remember telling the president we couldn't do something mm -hmm. because of internal processes or rules. And afterwards, um, my direct manager left. She said to me, she goes, you just, you just told the president we can do something. But these rules don't apply to him. <laughs> <laughs> and it was something silly like internal process or internal deliberation. And obviously, he can cut right through that. And I think at the time, you know, I, I didn't really have a sense of how the the pieces fit together in sort of a more yes, political yeah. corporate environment and yeah. it took time to adjust to that yeah yeah well you've now had a super successful career in-house so i assume you must have liked it tell me a little bit about how you've got to where you are today sure uh one, one day at a time um it, <laughs> uh, it, you know it, it really is just continual learning continual evolution um there's never been a point where I've been set in my ways about how things can and should be done. And I think that's really benefited me because I constantly reevaluate um, whether my approach is the best, talking to people about give, you know, giving me ideas about how to make things better and how to um, really continue to just evolve and change 
with every role, with every environment and with yeah. every situation. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's taken some, some time and there's definitely been a lot of sort of starts and stops and setbacks. Um, but I, I really feel like the continual growth and, and, you know, operating that way has helped me to, you know, make it to today. Was being the general counsel of a public company, was that always your goal or did it just kind of stumble into this? Uh, no, definitely wasn't always my goal. I think um, it was, I, I like, the goal for me is, is always to learn new stuff yeah. and to do new stuff because I just, I find it really exciting and interesting to see how other pieces fit together with the original pieces that I've learned about. Um, and so uh, for me, it was always, as I tried to step into a role, it was always, how do I get to learn and do more stuff? Um, and that sort of eventually led to, to, to today too, which is just getting to learn all these different pieces of legal um, and even beyond. I think one of the really great things about being in house is learning about what happens outside of legal. Yeah. Um, you know, sitting in meetings where I hear about, you know, how a company thinks about innovation and development and growth. And it, it's fun to see how legal fits into that. But it really is like a one piece, one small piece under a very big umbrella, which is always yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Well, what career advice would you give to younger lawyers who are, who are you know, in, in the in-house world trying to advance their career? What do you, you know, what, what advice would you give to them? I get this question a lot. Um, doing good work, working hard is table stakes. Yeah. I think that, you know, a lot of junior lawyers think, I'm working really hard. I'm putting in the hours. Why can't my career go anywhere? And I, I think you have to show up every day and do great work and have a reputation for excellence. And that takes time and that takes growth um, and, and really a, an attention to detail. But, but beyond that, it's thinking about how do you communicate with other people to, about what you're working on? I think that sometimes more junior or mid-level attorneys think if I put my head down and I do the work, that's going to get me there. But it really is that second piece of bringing the people around you into your process and sharing with them what you're working on, helping them to understand how your piece of the pie fits into the overall pie. I think that's incredibly important for continuing to grow your career because if you know, the tree falling in the forest, nobody knows about it, but yeah. you really want to make sure that people understand how you are contributing. Um, and just be willing to do the stuff that you that other people don't want to do. Sometimes yeah. there are projects that come up that don't fall neatly into category A or category B of a legal department and being willing to jump in and fill in the void. I, that's a, that's a, an incredibly valued skill and, and people really appreciate people who step up in times when there are no clear owners for things. So yeah. um, and then the last piece is know, know yourself. I think a lot of people come into this assuming they have certain skills and strengths or weaknesses, but really getting honest friends and coworkers around you who are going to give you the feedback to help you grow. So if you surround yourself with people who are like, yeah, you're great, you're doing great, it's going to be really hard to, to grow your career and succeed because you can't see where your, your problems might lie. So Michelle, you've been, you obviously were in private practice, you're in the government, you're now, you know, you've had a successful career in-house, you're the general counsel of a public company. Do you see yourself doing anything else in the future? Is there a non-legal career for you? Is there a teaching career? Is What, what else do you see in your future? Uh, I have always had a dream of an alpaca farm, but I'm not sure that's going to come <laughs> to be. That may be the retirement career. Uh, I... You know, I, I work with a really incredible nonprofit, Raphael House in San Francisco for oh. homeless families. Uh -huh. um, and they just incredible track record of helping families achieve stable housing, financial independence. So my goal is to continue working with that organization and 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 really helping the the families who who live there and call Raphael House yeah, home. Yeah. Do you mentor a lot of younger lawyers? I mean, do you, I assume you do that in your job informally. Do you also try to help, you know, mentor younger lawyers in their career? Yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan of company mentorship programs too. Mm -hmm. At Pinterest, we have one um, on the team where we get to mentor other more junior people on the team as they grow their careers. And I love it. 
um, I get a lot of outreach, even from, you know, law school students on LinkedIn. Yeah. And I love talking with them at the start yeah. of their career, because I think it's, it's a time of a lot of worry and fear about what's next. Totally. Um, and I sort of love talking with them and hopefully giving them ideas about how they can have great and exciting careers. In your role now as general counsel, do you pretty much delegate everything or do you still actually work on things directly now or do you is it really hard to do that because you have some you know you have so many things you've got to think about it's um it, it it ebbs and flows it depends on the issue it depends on the matter generally i'm not as hands-on as i used to be um mm. and it's a little bit more removed but there are times when i get involved more directly on sort of especially on those sort of issues that cover a number of legal areas um, and teams, and I, I might step in to, to help with sort of um, aligning the different subject areas. It's always interesting to me how certain legal areas may conflict with another one. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes I do step in and, and I, I enjoy sort of both the coaching as well as sort of the, the direct playing. <laughs> What, and what about the business side? Are you also pretty involved in the business side of the of the company as well as the general counsel? I think for certain sectors, the business side and the legal side are inextricable. Mm -hmm. There are certain industries where, you know, they need a contract and they call the lawyer when they need a contract. In others, um, like the, the online platform spaces that I've operated in, the law is completely intertwined with the future and forward looking business strategies in terms of how user data is used in terms of, you know, uh, are there parental regulations and oversight of social media, uh, the state of competition laws and how it might impact platforms. These are all areas where having a thorough understanding of what the law is and where it's going is core to business growth yeah. um, and how the business can responsibly evolve. Are you a big user of Pinterest yourself? I am. I am. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of uh, both crocheting and knitting and oh. there are patterns there and also home renovations. So I've spent some time uh, renovating homes down to the studs and Pinterest is just perfect for that. Did you, were you a user of the, as a service before you joined the company or you kind of discovered it when you joined the company? Yes. I used it way back when, when I was planning, um, you know, baby's first room. So well, well before I got here. Okay. So when you, when you got the opportunity to join the company, you'd already, be, you were already a big fan and a big user. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's super. Are cool. you a user or can can we? <laughs> I really am not, actually. I don't know. I mean, I know what Pinterest is and I, I certainly I've seen stuff, but I, yeah, I'm not a big user, but I'm not a big DIY person. I get the feeling that, that it's it's kind of more for that. So I don't. I Got don't. dinner but recipes, this, too. Maybe this, but maybe this conversation will get me <laughs> more interested now that I've talked to someone who actually is a big fan, because I don't think I've met anyone who uses a lot. Sometimes it takes someone who knows, uses a lot to kind of get you interested. Uh, well, I hope you check it out afterwards. There's a lot of good stuff. I, I'm always fascinated now when I meet um, sort of older teenagers and people in college, they keep telling me they love Pinterest and it, we, it's fastest growing co cohort on our platform. Mm -hmm. And so it's just really interesting to see another generation much younger than me discovering all of the great stuff that Pinterest has. Yeah, yeah. Well, Michelle, it's been a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate your taking the time. I know you're super busy, but the, your story has been wonderfully fascinating. If you do decide to do something else in the future, please come back and tell me about it. <laughs> I promise. Thank you. This is Richard Chu and Michelle Lee. Thanks. Thank you.